nothing unusual to see here this week, folks. Nothing unusual at all. Right, JB? Nah, it's just another week of football action to talk about on In the Huddle. I have a funny feeling we're going to have a prediction uh, segment this week uh, that we haven't had in the last couple weeks or so. So uh, I wonder what we'll talk about, which games we'll be picking, perhaps even from the uh, Liberty League. There may be a big game or two there. There could be. I've heard. I've heard this is a certain rivalry kind of week type thing going on. We'll have to. We'll have to come back to it though. Seeing that I can barely see right now, and I had to talk about thirty-four games with you, I think we're going to do away with the formalities, except for the fact that I will keep pointing out that that's going to be a winner uh, coming up this week. Uh, we'll what? See about I, that. I couldn't. I couldn't see that. See, you can't get the camera right yet. Who, who's uh, who that? Who that? Oh, is that is that some kind of pumpkin head of some sort? <laughs> It's October, baby. Oh, there it is. There it is. We're finally out of September, folks. Uh, but the last games played were in September, five Saturdays in September uh, for Division Three football. And we got a lot of games to go through, so enough uh, chicanery from us, except for uh, I, w- I want your overall assessment of week five before we leave it here. You know, I think there were some, some good conference games that were on the schedule that we were excited about seeing, and unfortunately, they turned out to be not so exciting. Um, there were actually a couple surprise uh, conference uh, matchups that, that were entertaining. We'll get into those. But some of the bigger games that we thought might be more competitive really weren't, including one of the ones that I think that you attended uh, down there in the Bronx. Well, I, I think it was pretty competitive in the end. We'll get to that in a moment, though. I, yeah. So. Uh, having said that, why don't we get it going here? 34 games to talk about in 15 minutes. This is going to be a lot, folks, so stick with us on this. It is time for crunch time for the games of September 29th, 2018. We're going to start in the CCC. It's alphabetically first, and hey, it's on my list first. Why not? And we'll start with right. Western New England at, at Salve at a 41 to 14 win for Western New England. Another 530 yards of total offense for the Golden Bears, and they are beginning to roll. They are catching fire at four and one. They held the Seahawks though to 73 rushing yards, and uh, running back Peter Hoff for 204 yards and a touchdown in this game. Uh, suddenly resurgent uh, after that loss to Springfield. Yeah, I think this uh, this team with the new quarterback and, and Alec Coleman is starting to really catch stride. I mean, obviously it helps if you're running back and it can crank through uh, 200 plus yards of, of carries. But yeah, it looks like to me, Frank, that this is a, a, a almost a two team race at this point. We saw. Uh, Endicott um, really catch fire uh, on Saturday. You know, coming off that big win at Hobart, you maybe there could have been a letdown, but they they have put themselves on a on a collision course with Western New England. They uh, beat uh, uh, Curry um, 55 to 22. Their quarterback Joe Kowalski went uh, for 245 yards and five touchdowns. Frank really sort of putting them away in the second half. It was competitive early on, but uh, Endicott really got. Uh, really got things going, and uh, hey, it looks like it's a two-team race in the CCC for, to me. Closing it out in the CCC, it's Nichols 42, UNE 24, and uh, 230 uh, passing yards by Michael Pina uh, and two touchdowns for him in that game. Let's go to the ECFC, the game that I was at, Huston 35, SUNY Maritime 21. It was 21 nothing in the first half in favor of Husson and uh, then three touchdowns in the final minute of the half made a halftime score 27 to 7. And uh, then it was a comeback time. SUNY Maritime got it to within 27 21. You're seeing a touchdown here. What a touchdown it was by Thomas Wright and company. Uh, Husson, though, responded. And here's a controversial uh, call, though. On fourth down, they were punting, and it looked like the ball was tipped. It should not have been roughing the uh, kicker, but it ended up being so. They scored a touchdown oh, to make it 35-21. Husson wins. Look, you, we don't know if SUNY Maritime would have scored or not in the ensuing possession. So, uh, you know, we can't say that that completely changed the game. Big call, though, at that point in time. And, look, congratulations. Husson resurgent, too, after, uh, you know, that union loss and everything. And, you know, 2-2 two and two in the season. But to get this win is important for them. 
Yeah, it definitely puts them back in the driver's seat in the ECFC, maybe much to the chagrin of the uh, NCAA. <laughs> you know, it's always tough when you have conference champs out in uh, the you know, banger mate, but uh, a big win for them in a, in a key conference rivalry game. So it's, things are looking up for the Eagles. Dean with a two game winning streak, beating Alfred State 44 to 26 and Gallaudet had to have 22 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. They were down 9-7, to seven, and they end up winning the game 29-9 yeah. to nine over Anna Maria in the battle of winless teams. Gallaudet becomes uh, a winner for the first time this season. Let's go to the Empire 8 and Cortland Utica. This was a really game. good game, uh, and Utica yeah. tied the game with 2 uh, remaining, but 102 remaining is when Cortland went back ahead, and here's that play, obviously of uh, 45-38 win ultimately for Cortland. Frenetic back and forth and uh, you know, game high uh, was Nicky Anderson, 171 receiving yards and two touchdowns for him. Yeah, I really thought that this was going to be another overtime game for the Pioneers. They really battled back. They were they were trailing by a couple of scores there late, but they uh, their freshman quarterback Wilcox uh, broke the school record, I think, with over 400 yards of passing, and, and really brought them you know, real close to potentially you know sending this game into overtime. But you have to give credit to uh, Brett Sagala. He had a huge game. Uh, the quarterback for the Dragons, 438 yards, four touchdowns, big win for uh, for Portland as they even their conference record at one and one after the loss to Alfred. And so they're still very much alive and in the hunt in the Empire 8. Brockport continues to roll. We'll show you a clip here of their win against St. John Fisher, 49-7. to uh, Look, Fisher's had one of those seasons where their strength of schedule in their first three games has been very good, to say the least. Uh, Washington <laughs> yeah. and Jefferson, and then Ithaca, now Brockport. Uh, so, I mean, look. Uh, this. Row, yeah. Yeah, 42-point loss obviously is not good. But uh, running back Joe Benedict for Brockport, 122 yards, two touchdowns. But Matt Arita, we've uh, featured this clip here, 75-yard interception return for touchdown, his third of the season. Uh, Brockport rolling at number four in the nation. Yeah, I mean, Matt Arita is already a first-team All-American in my book. Uh, three touchdowns in your first four games as a safety, pretty awesome. Alfred 27, SUNY Morrisville 22, surprised that game was that close, and Buffalo State 41, Hartwick 7. Uh, Buffalo State finally off the schneid uh, with the win there against Hartwick, uh, a team that's just perplexing me. That's like a Widener of Empire 8 play uh, this season, Buffalo State. Uh, we had higher expectations and weren't necessarily delivering. Not much to talk about in the Liberty League this week. Thomas Moore 48, St. Lawrence 12. Uh, the Saints had 600 yards of offense and ran 90 plays in that game. I kind of saw it coming, but I didn't necessarily think it was going to be like that uh, in that game. Let's go uh, to uh, Saints Bowl. <laughs> no, no, good point. Let's go to the Mascac before we completely leave that entire region uh, next. And uh, Westcon uh, lining up for a Week 10 uh, showdown against Framingham State now it looks like because they beat UMass Dartmouth. 40 to 27. The Corsairs are 2 and 1 in the conference, and the Colonials now 2 and 0. Uh, it's 506 yards at 420, so very close in that uh, situation. And a 97-yard interception return for a touchdown by Justin Witherspoon was the big difference maker as things were getting close in that game. That, that this clip, as you're watching it, uh, put it away for Western yeah. Connecticut, a team that has uh, not had the success level like this in a while. 4 and 0. Yeah, something's going on down there in Danbury. This was the Saturday night game. It kicked off around five o'clock, and uh, it certainly, you know, they, it was a back and forth, very offensive, uh, you know, high-scoring battle. But ultimately, it was the Colonials' defense that forced three turnovers, including the uh, the long pick six that, that we mentioned that really made the difference. Plymouth State beats Worcester State 38 to six. The Panthers' defense held the Lancers to 55 rushing yards. Great defensive performances uh, in a lot of these conferences this weekend. Pittsburgh yeah. State 36, Mass Maritime 20, and Bridgewater State 31, Westfield State 14. As Bears running back Nick Sanavica gets 104 rushing yards and two touchdowns for Bridgewater State. Up next, let's go to the MAC, and we've got a lot to talk about in the MAC. Six games. So we're using the entire graphic for this one. Uh, Delaware Valley 31, <laughs> Stevenson 20. Uh, Stevenson had a, I think it was a 17 to zero lead in this game, but things turned around, especially in the second half. One thing to note here, 
Dan Williams, uh, the quarterback for Stevenson, may have had some kind of ACL or late type injury, and he's out. Uh, running back, I believe, also for uh, Stevenson, as it may have had a leg injury or ACL type injury, and uh, that's going to be spell some problems here. So not only did they lose that lead in the game, but they may have lost a lot more uh, for the season here. Uh, but congratulations to Del Val, uh, showing some resurgence in that game, bouncing back. Yeah, and ultimately, you know, it was a combination of Deshaun Darden sort of taking charge in the second quarter, but also some special teams plays that really made the difference. There was a turnover at the one-yard line, I think, after a punt uh, that, that the Aggies uh, special teams unit caused that allowed them to, to get that 28-20 to lead and the cushion they needed to ride that game out. Let's go through the scores, and we'll talk about at least one more of these. Misericordia 52, Castleton 33. Misericordia is leading with Del Val in the MAC right now as an undefeated uh, like conference team. Of course, uh, that was first and foremost. They were highly ranked in my ballot coming into this season. My oh, goodness. Yeah. Wilkes 34, Alvernia 14 in the new Gridiron Classic uh, trophy game. I have no idea how a first-year nice. program gets a trophy game, but congratulations to Wilkes for winning that. Yeah, it's a nice-looking uh, trophy. Uh, uh, Kings 29, Lycoming 14. Lyco, we thought it had some uh, momentum, but uh, didn't yeah. quite work out that way. Uh, Widener 27, Lebanon Valley 21. As freshman quarterback Mitchell Veerling uh, had a 13-play, 75-yard game-winning drive in that game. And FDU Florham 48, Albright 34. Jagger Green and Company had to really uh, rally in this game to get that they winless did. Albright team, which is a surprise in and of itself, to the big win ultimately. Yeah, I mean, it took almost uh, you know seven touchdowns for him to for him to pull it off. But yeah, 355 yards, six touchdowns, a, a really great performance by Jagger Green to, to help lead his team back against an Albright team that's they're down, but they're not necessarily out. They had the lead at the half and and in the early second half. So you know, credit the Devils, they're improved to four and one and uh, two and one overall. The conference is looking pretty good there in New Jersey. Moving to the NJAC, here's a surprise of sorts. Number seven, Wesley, 28, Southern Virginia, seven. Uh, that was yeah. a game that took a while for uh, Wesley to really get a grip in it. Uh, you know, they were trailing, I think, early, and Wesley mm -hmm. just was not Wesley like in the first half. Are we seeing shades of possibly what we saw last year, where they're starting to play down to teams that may be uh, beneath them on paper, at least, or is Southern Virginia the real deal of sorts this season after a win against Kane? I don't know the answer to that. We'll see how it plays out. But the Knights uh, had 39 minutes of possession time, so they did a great job trying to minimize the damage that Wesley could do in this game. Yeah, and there were a lot of missed uh, field goal opportunities in this game too, Frank. So the, the offenses would kind of get things going and then they would sputter out. And I think there was like two or three uh, missed kicks. So the score could have been higher. Ultimately, Wesley started to you know, get some breathing room in the second half when they went up 21 to seven and ultimately you know, uh, got, the, got the win. But yeah, it's sort of a, a tough day. Uh, Kalik Bureaus had two touchdowns, but he also threw two interceptions. Um, kind of a slower, sluggish start for, for the Wolverines that were used to seeing, but you have to credit the Knights, their defense came to play. Here's a surprise. Christopher Newport, 38, Rowan, 9. Not necessarily that Christopher Newport won, but by the distance of the game, oh. Rowan was held at 97 total yards of offense, but you're going to object to that. Go ahead. Well, this is the first time that Christopher Newport's beaten the props, I believe, so that is a big deal for them, and they've improved to 3-1 and one overall. Uh, you know, they Obviously, they, they missed that game with Frostburg State that was canceled and, and wasn't rescheduled, so their, their, their schedule's a little bit off, but you know, you know, keep an eye on the captains. We'll see if... Uh, this win propels them into the NJAC race or if it's really going to come down to this big game this weekend, Frank, between number six, Frostburg, and number seven, Wesley. And look at Montclair go, 27 to nothing over Kane as uh, Craig Merkel had 104 rushing yards and two touchdowns for Montclair State. It's the third shutout of Kane this season for teams uh, NJAC or otherwise. Salisbury 42, William Patterson nothing as the Seagulls quarterback Jack Nowitzki had 130 rushing yards and one passing touchdown. Let's go back to New England as I almost forgot, uh, the new Mac, uh, and then we'll talk NESCAC last uh, as we normally do. Uh, MIT 31, uh, Merchant Marine 24, our coach guest this week will be Brian Bubna of the 5-0 and 
MIT engineers at this point. Udgum Goyle, uh, 25 for 43, 362 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Uh, I'll take the four touchdowns with one interception any day of the week if I'm a coach. Uh, sure. But they, they had to pull away. Uh, you're seeing the clip of when they were tied 17-17, and finally MIT was able to pull away with Goyle's arm. Uh, you know, this is a team that maybe has not played the meat of the new Mac schedule yet, and really hasn't. But look, five and zero is five and zero, and we'll see if they build up the confidence as they get into that part of it. Yeah, I mean, and they, that interception was early on in the game, Frank. So Goyle and the offense really came alive, and and you can tell that it was a tough day for the Mariners because they had under 150 rushing yards, and their leading player was a wide receiver. Uh, with 156 yards and a touchdown, that being uh, Luke Jamison. So the, the Mariners were a little bit off their game after they, they kind of fell behind there. Coast Guard 20, Catholic 9, as uh, Chris Gardner ran for 190 uh, rushing yards for Coast Guard. And uh, our Ryan Jones interview was uh, well received uh, ultimately last week. Appreciate Coast Guard's help with that. If you haven't seen it, it's on yep. Facebook. Uh, Springfield 33, Norwich 16. Uh, Pride had three 100 yard rushers. We saw Chad Shade in the uh, box score. We're not sure if he returned, what was going on with that, or if it was a, an accident or mistake, but we'll uh, check on his condition as the week progresses. WPI 30, Maine Maritime 7. Uh, Maine Maritime will be uh, hosting MIT coming up this Saturday, so uh, we'll see if they can pick up their first win against the uh, lossless MIT engineers. We'll end with the NESCAC, and wow, what a surprise to me in some ways, but if you know Coach Ray and the job he's doing at Williams, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, and I think you weren't necessarily shocked by this. 21-16 to over Trinity of Connecticut. The East quarterback, Bobby Mameron, with 249 yards of total offense and two touchdowns. Two interceptions, six tackles for loss and defense by Williams. And this is a real score that pops out of people when they see it because after going winless a couple years ago, Williams is thoroughly back. Yeah, Coach Ray has definitely got the Eves uh, back on track and in pretty much the lead position. I know that some folks view uh, maybe Amherst as the top team uh, or tough since they're both so 3-0, and but this a win over Trinity is a big deal. The Bantams rarely lose in, in NESCAC play, so that's a statement win there for Coach Ray and the Eves. Finally, rounding things out, Hamilton with a surprising win, 33-29 over pump Wesleyan. Block, yeah. It, yeah, it really took the pump block with 134 remaining, recover for the game-winning touchdown to solidify that game and that win for Hamilton. Congratulations to them. Middlebury, 31, Colby, 14. Amherst, 24, Bowden, 14. That Williams-Amherst showdown starting to loom really large now. We've got plenty of games between now and then. And Tufts, 47, Bates, 14 as uh, it was Jumbo's quarterback, Ryan McDonald, with 368 yards and three touchdowns. And James, that was crunch time for the games of September 29th, 2018. 15 minutes, 30 yeah. seconds or thereabouts, I think it was. So uh, we actually did pretty, pretty well good. on that. So congratulations to you. Uh, let's go back for a second here, though, to a game that I did attend as uh, we were talking about in the uh, ECFC, uh, Hudson SUNY Maritime, 35-21. Hudson with two losses, mm -hmm. if they were to win the ECFC, probably would be the traveling team. And the question is, where would they be traveling to if they can pull out the ECFC? You brought up the travel restrictions and whatnot. Uh, the NCAA is going to have to scratch your head with what to do with it again uh, if it turns out this way. But there's a lot of football to be played between now and then. And uh, I had a couple interviews, uh, you know, discussing a little bit about this uh, from the Saturday game. Uh, first, let's uh, have my interview with Coach Gabby Price, uh, the head coach of Husson, where we talk about the travel. We talk about the game itself, uh, where uh, that was a very headstrong SUNY Maritime team trying to come back at the end, as we kind of expected. Yeah. And uh, very personal. Remind me of Ed Zaloom, I told him after uh, this interview uh, from uh, WPI. He even had anecdotes about Ed Zaloom uh, afterward, uh, not on camera, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it, it really is a fraternity. Record. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It really is a fraternity of coaches out there, uh, especially of uh, their age frame, uh, which is 39 plus, of course. So here is uh, Coach Gabby Price with me. Mike Rossi here with head coach of Husson, Gabby Price. And, Coach, uh, that game... Uh, you know, early on, 21-0 looked like it was really in hand for Husson, but that Maritime team did come back as you probably expected them to at a certain point. What were you telling your team at halftime and then, uh, let's say, at 27-21 when this thing was starting to turn around? Well, halftime, I'm saying, hang on. <laughs> well, 
we knew they're great. They throw the ball great, uh, and they ran the ball in that jet sweep today pretty well. But you know, you just you, the kids been a great. The young man, uh, Mr. Rice, played great at quarterback. They've got great receivers and line protect. So we knew they could score for sure. You, I, I'm not going to say you have trouble replacing John Smith this season. Obviously, I was just saying to Corey, he's irreplaceable in certain ways because of his talent. But your running backs have begun to kind of step it up for you the last three games, and that seems to have uh, helped Corey maybe open things up a little bit himself. Is that a good read on it? And uh, tell me about your running backs right well, now. It's a great assessment. Actually, I started running back with almost 500 yards, didn't make the trip. He had hurt in practice last year. He hasn't practiced. Meese has been our second or third. Played great. Sean Noel. Uh, he'll play great as we move on here. But the thing about John, not to talk about John, it wasn't just a football player. He was a tremendous leader. He gave us tremendous confidence. That's what we're trying to get out of our guys. He's just tremendous confidence, tremendous leader, never missed practice, all those kinds of things. Not just John. He's just a great football player, but it's really what he gave us outside of football. Yeah, different than running the ball. Absolutely. But also now let's look at your defense because they had to stand up there uh, to yeah. a certain degree. Uh, in the third quarter, they had a key. Uh, turnover on down, say fourth, fourth quarter, obviously. Uh, they was getting nervous, but they held, hold on at the end of the day. So give me your assessment of your defense at this point. Well, I just told the defensive line they won the game. Uh, anytime, football changes, you, as everybody knows, they can score at any time here and these kinds of things. So really, they just had to hold in there. They did a good job. We have some very good players there. We've just faced some great quarterbacks, Union. Uh, the, the young man at UNE last week against West Wing and, and uh, today. We've really faced some great quarterbacks that can throw the ball deep. So now, uh, how do you get your team convinced that they haven't won anything yet when it comes down to it? Because a lot of people looked at this game as the ECFC de facto championship game because of how the rest of the league is fared in non-conference play. But obviously, you got to play games to play here. How do you keep them focused right now? Well, I'm not going to right now, Frank. <laughs> Probably not to Monday. Then Monday we'll talk about Dean. That's fair. an outstanding team. I uh, was an outstanding coach. Uh, last year I voted them one or two in the league and high again this year. They just, they, they're just a very good football team, Dean. So really that will come on Monday and we will we'll tell them. We'd like to go on to the next game. Uh, life's so short in Division Three. then on in scholarship that enjoy each game and then we'll move on on Monday. How long is the trip back home? I think it took us like seven hours to get down here and there'll be a lot more joys on the way down. We don't talk on the way down, but on the way back they'll actually they'll probably be exhausted and we'll watch some movies. and. We watched Long Lone Survivor on one of the buses, and <laughs> well, I think we all were crying at the end of it. But it's what it is, Division Three. We travel a lot. Sony was up there last year, so it's reciprocal, and these things happen, Frank. Well, enjoy the view for a few more minutes here, and enjoy the win all week long, yeah. because this was a big one, a 35-21 yeah. victory against SUNY Maritime. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank I appreciate you. it very much. And that was head coach of Hudson. Gabby Price with me and uh, a seven hour drive down to uh, SUNY Maritime and back uh, for them. Obviously, uh, they could watch quite a few movies. In fact, that little clip was uh, highlighted on the Around the Nation podcast uh, today that was released. So we appreciate Pat Coleman and company uh, playing a little clip of that. Uh, but, you know, Coach Price had to be a little bit nervous there at 27-21. We brought up the punt block situation or the punt tip situation, uh, still leading yep. to a penalty. You can't blame the uh, the refs fully. Uh, Coach D. Uh, Gitano uh, had liked some of my tweets about uh, the officiating being overall even-handed throughout the game. This was a miss, obviously, by them. Again, showing the uh, yeah. picture of the hand on the ball uh, that caused it to arc kind of uh, weirdly afterward. Uh, it didn't make any kind of noticeable sound. That's the problem. And often referees try to hear as much as see these situations. So there's that. Um, here's a uh, player. I want your thoughts on him before we uh, go into the interview. Uh, Corey Brandon, the quarterback for Husson. Uh, he's uh, he started interestingly, but you know, with the run game picking up for Husson, his arm has become more important as well because the options are multifaceted now. They are not one dimensional, and that allows him to be Corey Brandon, uh, a very good quarterback in a New England school that's got a winning track record now. What's your thoughts on Brandon? Yeah. 
Well, we knew coming into this season that this would have to be, you know, his team this year with the graduation of John Smith. The I think it was a 2,000 yard rusher uh, last year helped them uh, beat uh, Springfield in the playoffs and and uh, showed up pretty well against a, a Del Val team that made it to the the quarterfinal. So uh, we knew that Husson had the talent, but the question mark was whether or not Brandon could really take over the offense. And so far this season, there's been some ups and downs. I mean, they they are at the 500 record, but this win puts them kind of back into the, the conversation for an ECFC title, their, their final chance at it as they will move to the CCC, um, I think next season, Frank. So they want to go out with the, you know, sort of the, the undefeated <laughs> uh, defending champions, uh, Mark, and then, you know, maybe they take a, a bus ride to either uh, Springfield again, maybe they take a bus ride to Endicott or MIT, depending on how uh, some other other things you know, pan out there with some of these New England schools. Here's my interview with Corey Brandon, quarterback of Husson. Frank Rossi here after a 35 to 21 win by this Husson team. Corey Brandon, their quarterback, is uh, with me here. And Corey, this is a really back and forth game. Your team takes a 21 to zero lead uh, in sometime in the second quarter, then back and forth all around. Let's start with the beginning of the game. It seemed like your team, your arm specifically, was uh, beginning to dominate uh, SUNY Maritime a little bit. Was it kind of like? That old school mentality of, you know, hustle and rolls to the conference from time to time. Were you getting that feel again in the first half? We, we definitely wanted to come out and make a statement in this game. It's a, one of our rivals. They're a great team. And uh, we knew we had to come out and play our best. And we established our best early in the game. It was 1 through 11, making plays. And that's where we got that confidence from early on, help us with those big plays. So then things start turning around a little bit. Third quarter, fourth quarter. Third quarter, they couldn't really score, but they were starting to make some yards on this team. Fourth quarter, they do score. What were you telling your team at that point? I was telling everyone to stay calm, stay cool. If we can stay together, that's how we're going to win this game. And we did. Everyone stayed together. Nobody broke focus. And we, we were able to get the W. You were 15 for 30, uh, three touchdowns, over 200 yards in this game. Your numbers have seemed to go up as your running backs have maybe – started to replace John Smith. I know he's irreplaceable in a lot of ways. Has that really helped open things up for you over the last three games? Uh, absolutely. When the running back's playing good, it definitely opens up the pass game. But, I mean, our offensive line has been playing really well lately, helping those guys, helping me, helping our receivers, too. I mean, when they can give us some time, give the receivers time and make some plays, it's great for everybody. It opens up our whole playbook. Now, I talked about this week the fact that the rest of the conference was basically about 2-15, and 15, uh, aside from these two teams and out-of-conference games coming into this week. Obviously, this puts you guys in kind of the catbird seat, as they say. But is it possible that your team could start looking too far forward here? How do you, as a team leader, get them to take it one game at a time and actually win this conference? Because today was only one game. Right. We look at all of our, our conference games as championship games because if you drop a conference game, it really has a big play on who wins the conference. So we really have, ever since I've been a Hudson Eagle, we take – each week as a championship game and we do not look past for the next week or anything like that. We are a week to week team and that's how we've always been and we always will be. Corey, our uh, player guests always get to give shout outs, so shout outs to anyone that's watching. Right. Uh, shout out to my mom and dad, they're the best. Mom and dad, you are the best, absolutely. Congratulations on the big win today, Corey. JB, that was uh, Corey Brandon, quarterback, senior quarterback uh, for the Husson Eagles. And uh, they're going to need him to continue performing well to uh, win that race and have a chance in playoff games. Remember, they beat Springfield in the opening round last year. Uh, it surprised yeah. a lot of people, but more power to them. Uh, they are serious about keeping up that winning way uh, up in Maine. Let's talk about the uh, different conferences here. Uh, we'll start with the CCC again. Uh, and look, Western New England, Endicott, Nichols are your three uh, 1-0 teams. Curry and Salve both lose. And that's mm -hmm. an interesting state of affairs. You wouldn't necessarily expect that. You would expect that it would be Western New England, Curry, Salve, Regina at the top of the heap again. Becker has yet to play a conference game, but granted, they're probably not going to be much of an influence here. West New England's hit a stride. They have scored uh, 183 points, which is far and away the best of their conference. And I, I, I don't know who's going to catch them right now. I, I just don't think that Salve Regina uh, has the ability to, you know, expect them to lose twice, which is really more or less what they have to expect, or some kind of tiebreaker. And Curry doesn't look like that team right now. Could it be Endicott? Is Endicott that good that they can do it is the question. 
I think there's potential, and it's going to, you know, I think their next uh, couple of games are, are pretty winnable ones for, for the Gulls. If they can stay on task, there's a very good chance that they will be 6-2 uh, and two heading into the um, Week 10 matchup uh, where they're going to host Western New England, which could be you know, for the conference title. I mean, they do have to host Salve the following weekend um, to, as maybe a, a potential championship game or spoiler round, depending on how things go round robin wise. But it really looks like that 11 uh, 3 game is going to be for the CCC title. And again, uh, in week 10, we'll be doing our uh, D3 Blitzer uh, program, uh, or we intend to at least, as long as the schools cooperate, to uh, bring you kind of a whip around with all these important games of week 10. There are going to be several that we can already spot them uh, right now yeah. on the schedule. And so you'll want to stay tuned for that. We'll have a lot more about that as we approach it in about one month from now. Uh, Hassan and Dean and Gallaudet. Of course, those are going to be the three undefeated teams of the ECFC. Well, maybe one of them we <laughs> expected. Uh, Dean, though, uh, with a two-game winning streak at two and three. Uh, what Huss and Dean, I'm trying to see here uh, when they play each other because I, I hadn't really thought of that game as being crucial. Uh, but that's a big game coming up on October 5th. That's Friday at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I'll be watching that one personally. I think you will be too because that's going to really dictate if Huston creates separation against a team that may, just may, have some say here. And Coach Price talked about Dean, and Dean's a good program, he said. And uh, one of the ones that he had voted uh, higher than you might expect, he had already seen it in them. So Dean... Uh, let's watch what happens here. Husson wins it. I think you're almost lights out in that conference. Dean wins it. Yeah. Whole new ball game for everybody at that point. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, Coach Price's biggest job right now is to remind his team they've won absolutely nothing so far except for one game against <laughs> exactly. SUNY Maritime. We That's keep right. saying it, but it's true. Uh, new Mac, let's go. Uh, I don't want to forget you guys this time. My bad on the uh, – the uh, nah. crunch time segment there. MIT at 5-0, and 0, but when you look at the conference race, it's MIT, Coast Guard, and Springfield. Uh, and uh, let's see, what, what games do we have coming up? MIT, First plays, one, MIT plays Springfield in two weeks. They, they got Maine Maritime this weekend, uh, which will be a homecoming for Coach Bubna, who, who started his coaching career up there in Castine, Maine. But yeah, that Coast Guard uh, MIT matchup uh, in week seven, uh, will be a, a ch opportunity for some separation. MIT doesn't play Springfield till week 10, um, so it's going to be one of those things where maybe even week 11. 11, it's, it's 11. Backfill the schedule, so we could be having to wait till the very final week of the season. Uh, with with Thomas Moore beating St. Lawrence, they're still in the hunt for a Pool B bid. It's ultimately going to come down to whether or not the Thomas Moore can keep uh, a loss off their record. Their schedule's pretty tough, so I still feel like the NUMAC champion, whether they're nine and one or ten and zero, should get that um, NCAA bid. We'll see. Uh, more likely, if it's a ten and zero MIT team versus a nine and one Springfield potentially, but Springfield has a track record, so we'll have to see how that all paid plays out. Western Connecticut in the MASCAC here. Uh, the, the, what four and zero, two and zero right now uh, in conference. Yeah. Framingham State three and one two zero again. They are uh, really on a collision course. It seems like for week ten, uh, we got weeks yes. uh, six, seven, eight, and nine though before that. So if any teams want to step up and make me look wrong, feel free to. That is uh, your yeah. choice and your ability to do so. Uh, UMass Dartmouth, Bridgewater State two and one each. To see though, you got a pack of four teams. Make that five teams with two losses here. Plymouth State, Westfield State, Worcester State, Fitchburg State, Massachusetts Maritime. All with two losses. I got to say, in a conference this long, with you know the nine teams that we see in this conference, I think a two-loss team has really no chance right now. I, I mean, it's going to take some real carnage up top to be in this race still, and we'll see how it shakes out. What are you highlighting in terms of games uh, this week to watch? Well, you know, I think um, Plymouth State Bridgewater is interesting because Bridgewater, after kind of a, a rough start to the year, has, has quietly turned things around, and they have a potential to play spoiler here. If they can beat Plymouth State on, on uh, Friday night, the 5th, it's one of the a couple of Friday night games we have coming up this weekend, they could potentially uh, try to upset the apple cart down on October 20th when they travel to WestCon. So look for the Bears to be the potential spoiler here in the mix, Frank, because they're they're starting to get their feet under them and they're winning some ball games in, in impressive fashion. 
I'm going to uh, highlight uh, Framingham State, uh, Fitchburg State. Fitchburg State played, gets their first win against Mass Maritime, 36-20. Uh, to 20. And Framingham State was, I believe, off uh, this past Saturday, if I'm yep. remembering correctly. So you've got a team that's gotten a little bit of confidence back, a team that hasn't played in a couple of weeks. This could be interesting. I, I, maybe not you know, a win for Fitchburg State by any means, but let's see what uh, Framingham State has coming back from the bye week, if they start rolling or if they start a little bit you know, strangely for the first half and then finally get themselves back together in the second half type of situation. So I'll keep my eye on that game as well. Uh, coming up this mm -hmm. Saturday. I think we've covered all the New England folks, so let's go over, to, well, well, except for the NESCAC. NESCAC. Well, you want to go NESCAC now? I will go to the NESCAC now, just because you requested it. I do yeah. request some dedications here, like any good DJ does. And it's going to be <laughs> a question right now of uh, will Williams and Amherst basically stay undefeated, uh, to, you know, leading up to their matchup. Williams is going to be going to Bates, and Amherst is going to Middlebury. And when you look at the standings, uh, you see it's Amherst, Tufts, and Williams right now with Middlebury with one loss. For Middlebury to survive here, they have to win. Uh, that's basically, yeah. you know, w how this goes. And, you know, Williams against Bates, probably not a great game on paper. Tufts, Bowden, to me, Amherst, Middlebury is the game of the week in the NESCAC. Yeah, and, I, and I, what I want to see here, because I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little skeptical about Amherst. I know that they've been uh, you know, ranked at the top of our friend Matt Noonan's New England football poll, but they, their wins are, are not that dominant over teams that, that haven't won any games in the, in the, uh, in the NESCAC, I guess, save for Hamilton, because they, uh, they did surprise Wesleyan. Uh, last weekend, so I, I, I'm looking forward to that Amherst Middlebury matchup. If, if Amherst can win that convincingly, then I think you know you have some interesting stuff starting to shape up near the the end of the conference schedule, where the Mammoths have to play at Trinity in Week 10, and then of course the the little big game of um, you know them hosting Williams on uh, the 10th of November. So interesting to see if this Amherst team is as good as they as some people think they are. We'll find out. So now the Liberty League, folks. You, when you call it the conference schedule on d3football.com, it's kind of funny because nothing's played yet. You think you're, you're in the wrong year or something. There is absolutely yeah. no conference game heading into week six of the season because of the number of teams there, and they didn't play anything earlier than now. So guess yeah. what? Everybody's 0-0 zero zero in terms of meaningfulness right now. That, that's really what it comes down to. I told the Union fan this, and they were like, oh, no, they're 4-0. Well, yeah, okay, they're 4-0, but you know what? They're 0-0 as are the other five teams of the conference right now. And we have some really good games to start right off the bat. Union Hobart, yeah. RPI Ithaca. Uh, I mean, RPI Ithaca is two teams that are essentially uh, getting points or getting ranked uh, ultimately in the poll. Top 25 uh, game, yep. Yep, Union at Hobart. Hobart really needs a bounce back here. I mean, it is possible that Hobart could win this conference, but they're gonna have to get through Union to start an undefeated team. If they lose this game, season's over as far as I'm concerned for Hobart at that point for, you know, playoff possibilities. Yeah. I, I Probably the last word that Coach DeWall wants to hear me utter is playoffs right now. But, look, again, 0-0, everybody. So let's see where it falls out. And w what's your initial thoughts? We'll talk more Friday about this game possibly on a uh, prediction show. But w what's your view? Well, I mean, Union's been torching everybody with their high-powered offense with this Andre Ross Jr. wide receiver and then Ike Irabor at running back. They've got some really talented specialists, and Hobart's defense so far this season hasn't been able to stop anybody. They rank near the bottom of Division Three in most of the key categories. Um, you know, they got uh, you know, lit up by Shenandoah. They, they gave up a lot of points to – um, to Brockport in week one. So there's an opportunity for Union to really stick it to the Statesman who, who had a seven-game win streak until uh, Union beat them last year. I don't even think uh, Ali Marpet, who's supposed to be in attendance along with some other recent uh, Statesman grads, can, can let's see. You know, I don't know. If you see a big 310-pound, six-foot-four offensive tackle out there with long hair, then, then you know. <laughs> but it's going to be a challenge for the Statesman to, to cool off this red-hot Dutchman team. And RPI Ithaca, quick thought on that game as well. Uh, we've been picking an RPI schedule. I, I feel like Ithaca has shown themselves to be the better team. But you know what? When you always underestimate RPI, they seem to bite you in the backside. Uh, this is a game that Ithaca absolutely must win, uh, just, not just for national prominence. And they're number 13 in my ballot right now. 
And it's one of those, I look at my ballot and say, after John Carroll at number 11, who's next? And there's a sea of mediocrity in terms of just the overall landscape of Division Three after the top 10, top 11 teams. And so Ithaca has shown me, playing the way they have, undefeated, except for the Brockport close game, who's number four in the nation, don't forget, that they are worthy of attention right now. RPI, though, mm -hmm. looking to knock them off the mantle a little bit. We'll see. What are you thinking? I think it's going to come down to defensive play and turnovers, just like last year. I mean, it was ultimately the the defense of RPI that that gave uh, Nobby a tough tough day. I think he threw four interceptions in that game. Nobby has been a little interception prone in, in some of these, even the wins that Ithaca's had, and the defense has sort of had to carry them a little bit. Um, I think they're going to need a steady dose of uh, DeHaiti at running back uh, for the Bombers to kind of keep the RPI defense. Um, Know, a little bit more honest their defensive backs are really strong so i mean if, if, if this turns into some kind of shootout it could go, end up in rpi's direction but i do agree with you i think ithaca is the team to beat in the liberty league and this weekend we'll, we'll pr see if that proves out or not we'll go a little faster through the final uh couple <laughs> conferences a few conferences here empire eight brockport uh <laughs> sitting atop obviously uh with alfred and buffalo state brockport alfred's in two weeks so they have to be careful not to overlook Hartwick at Hartwick, 2 o'clock on Saturday. I, uh, I'm going to estimate um, a combined 1,100 yards in that game uh, between the two teams, with Brockport <laughs> probably winning it 72-60 to 60 or 50. Now, their defense is better than that, 72-40. to 40. How's that? Uh, Hartwick yeah. just, they seem to be able to score in, you know, droves, but they also had a tough go of it this past weekend against Buffalo State. So I'm not sure what happened in that game exactly. Uh, Brockport's defense, I, I'm being tongue-in-cheek, folks. They, they probably will hold Hartwick to right. a low number, uh, but two offensive yeah. powerhouses at times uh, in the Empire 8 going at it. That's kind of the, what stands out to me. Uh, Alfred at Buffalo State, don't get caught looking ahead there. Alfred as well, I guess, is my only other thought there. Let's go to the MAC before we go to the uh, NJAC, which has a uh, prime matchup I will kind of hint at there. Uh, Del Val, mm -hmm. Misericordia. Who knew? I mean, that's, that's yeah. obviously the top two we thought would be uh, at this stage. We said it earlier. <laughs> yeah. Misericordia is going to host Alvernia, so they should be the heavy favorite in that game. Uh, the words that Misericordia yeah. is not used to hearing, heavy favorite, uh, at least for them. Yeah, right. Del Val is not playing uh, a conference game uh, this week. Oh. This is their uh, off week, and uh, they are... Uh, off entirely. We have a Alvernia Misericordia. That's kind of like the highlight game in the uh, MAC right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a good opportunity for John Drock's team uh, at Wilkes to maybe pick up their third win of the season against Albright on Saturday. Um, Widener Kings actually could be a pretty high scoring, entertaining game. But yeah, for the most part, I think things are going to be a little quiet in the, in the Mac until we get to the, the sort of latter half of the schedule. And, and you can see there's going to be some games in, in uh, week 10 um, and week 11 with some of these rivalries and, and so on. So I think this, this will be an interesting race to the finish. I still think, you know, Del Val is probably the, the team to beat, uh, especially now that they, they took care of Stevenson. So We'll have to see how this shakes out, Frank, but it's, it seems like things in the MAC are kind of starting to fall into place a little bit. There are two conferences in the country with four undefeated teams. The MIAC, I believe, uh, is uh, one of them, and the NJAC is the other, which is tough to believe in a 10-team conference that we have four undefeated teams in the overall and the conference record right now. It is, uh, yeah. you know, let's go to the conference records. 3-0, 3-0, 3-0, Salisbury, Wesley, Montclair State, Frostburg State at 2-0. and and who does Frostburg State play this week, JB? Number seven, Wesley. It's going to be one of the big marquee matchups of week six. There aren't a ton of great games this weekend, but this is definitely uh, one of them. And so th we'll be keeping a very close eye on this. Um, we're going to preview this game a little later uh, this week. We're hoping to have a, a Wesley player talk about their win at uh, Southern Virginia and preview the Frostburg game. Frostburg, as we know, has been off for uh, a week and a half now or, or longer, basically, because of the um, some of the, the challenges around Hurricane Florence. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, can this Wesley defense hold off Connor Cox and the uh, and the offense there uh, down in Frostburg? That's our conference uh, recap here. And uh, as you know, uh, we've done crunch time earlier, and that's 
pretty much it here. We've got coverage throughout the week. Brian Bubna coming up uh, as our coach interview. We'll have a player interview as well in the next couple of days. And uh, hopefully we'll preview show on Friday because we do have enough big games here to talk about. Two in the Lurie League, one in the NJAC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, my goodness. Would you please stop with that thing? Because you know I'm going to have to like <laughs> then drag out the next uh, thing. Uh, we got uh, a union football right here. So just saying. It's a little flat right now. I probably got to yep. pump this thing up. Uh, but anyway, uh, this week, a lot of action to talk about. Week six of the season coming up. Remember, week 10, we're going to have a lot more coverage uh, with playoff predictions, regional rankings, etc. cetera, uh, and then the uh, Blitzer show. So a lot coming up. Uh, this is kind of October is that month where we begin ramping up, and I get a lot less sleep, uh, much like you, because of the action that's yep. going to come up here, folks. Last thoughts, JB? Well, if you're if you if you're not following us on Twitter, give us a follow at, at D three FB Huddle. Uh, you can follow Frank at Frank Rossi, and you know, hey, tweet at us. So, you know, send us a message. Tell us what you want to hear about. Um, and if you you know if you like you know game previews, if you like helmets, if you if you like uh, certain conferences and so on and so forth, uh, certain players. I mean, I you know, give us a shout. We're we're certainly open to uh, to interacting, and we appreciate uh, all the you know we're over. Uh, 21 almost 2200 followers uh, so we appreciate that and um, yeah I mean I think it's been an interesting season by the by this point we're almost halfway and it's it's gonna be a rivalry weekend so hey this is one <laughs> one weekend out of the year Frank and I aren't friends I'm like biting us and I yeah oh, hey, that was so, incredible <laughs> yeah. so anyway, piece so too give us a, yeah uh, we appreciate everyone uh, watching the stuff with the stats we've had so far this season. I think it was almost 11,000 views or something crazy last week, Frank. So we appreciate all the fan support. And, uh, hey, we got more stuff coming at, you, coming at you this week. Coming at you. That's a Hobart thing. We got a lot more Will Bellamy and company coming uh, this week. How's that? Uh, we'll see. I, I don't know. I'm going to tell Coach DeWall to try to get that Marpet kid in the game somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be a little tough to sneak in, but we'll see what happens. Folks, we'll see you yeah. later this week. I don't think he's eligible. <laughs>